Good morning and welcome to New Crossing Church. It's good having you here and, uh, and all the visitors are especially welcome and, uh, and there is in your bulletin an outline uh, to follow along and be a student of the Messiah by uh, writing down the things in sermons, what I mo- my prayer is the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and something he's trying to nudge you. In your understanding, nudging he wants to change within you, nudge you into something he wants to do. And so it's good to keep a pen in hand and a piece of paper to write on whatever he speaks to you. And also these outlines are for your benefit, just to help you follow. And I do need to make a correction on this Sunday's uh, heading. It's uh, Sad versus Burning Hearts. It says Luke 23, verses 13 through 35. It's Luke 24. So don't worry, we're not... At the end of Luke, and now we're going to work backwards to chapter 1, and uh, 13 through 35. So if you could correct that on there. It's corrected on the um, website for those that are going to pull their outline off from there. So we are in Luke 24, and we're exploring How Jesus still meets with us after his resurrection. He came not just for what he was going to accomplish in being born here, but in what he wants to do in your life and my life after the fact also. So in this, and ask, ask your heart, heart, what is it I'm experiencing? What am, what am I feeling? Where is there maybe a sadness in my heart. The section, the heading on this section is on the road to Emmaus. And it's, it's, it's the longest post-resurrection story we have in Luke. And it's so cool because the two disciples in, that, in, that Jesus meets could be any one of us. It, it wasn't one of the, the two of the eleven disciples at this point in the story. And so it really speaks to us. It's an amazing, very cool encounter that they had with Jesus in such a personal way. And we are in this series called Paradigm Shift, where we need to encounter the Messiah, the Redeemer, in such a way that it that what we thought we believed about who Jesus was, or the Father, because the Son is the perfect imprint reflection of the Father's heart. So if you question what God feels towards you, what he sees in you, what life's about, Jesus comes and brings this shift in our worldview, the way we look at the world, which needs a shift. We need to have the shift of what of where we can see God's kingdom. And the kingdom, ultimately, the kingdom of God is not a place, but it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. So where is your Emmaus, this place that you're heading? Have you identified where your spiritual feet, your soles of your shoes are taking you? So let's start with a prayer and and then enter into this story. So Father, we ask that we come to know your Son because as we know him, we know you. Jesus, we ask that you send your spirit because it's your spirit that unlocks the interpretation, the meaning, and helps us apply the scriptures to our hearts and minds. Let us not separate these things. Let us not hear this as just an event that happened in history thousands of years ago where you met two people on a road to Emmaus, but let us enter the story and see ourselves in their shoes so that we, like them, them, can come to this place where our hearts will burn for you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, we invite you, Holy Spirit, into this morning, into the Word of God. In your name we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Let me just first, before I even re- start our reading, I just want to put up Luke 24, verse 32, because, so, because in a way it's like a key verse of the passage. 
And the two disciples we're about to read about said at the end of the story, they said to each other, did our hearts, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This story could be called the return to Jerusalem where this passage comes from as they share their experience, their encounter with Jesus Christ. And we are going to enter in the story and we're going to end with communion, which you'll see why it just seems so appropriate uh, at the end of this story. So let's read first verses 13 through 16 in chapter 24. And what's happened up to this point in the way, uh, as way of background is that Jesus has been crucified. He died on the cross. They, they buried him in a tomb. And it's been three days. And so this is, this is Sunday. This is the Sunday of the day of the week, and we encounter the risen Jesus in this story. But before this happened, Sarah spoke on how the women that were present at the cross came back. The Marys and and Joanna came back to anoint the body of Jesus in the tomb where he was buried. And the stone had been rolled away, which was impossible, except we know that it was two angels that rolled that, opened up that tomb so they could see, not to let Jesus out. The angels didn't have to open the door so Jesus could get out of the tomb. But they rolled away the stone so that these disciples and us can see that that's not where Jesus is. And hopefully that resurrection, his arising from the dead, opens up the doors of our heart to receive him in a fresh way. So as I read this story this morning. Maybe you even close your eyes as I get to the passages just to enter into it spiritually. There's been a long tradition of Christians taking these roads to Emmaus to encounter Jesus, and that's my desire for you guys this morning is to also encounter him and find a burning heart. So 13 through 16. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Over and over, we're going to see that word with in this story. That's why that is the key thought of Luke is that we understand that God is with us, but also that we are with him. Verse 16, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Isn't this fascinating? And, and so three points I will want us to grasp this morning and what it means, three points of being Jesus being with us is the first, Jesus walks with us even when you do not recognize him. These disciples did not recognize that the risen Lord had joined them on this journey, the seven-mile hike away from Jerusalem, which is on a hill. So kind of, you know, we all want those pinnacle peak experiences. But then you walk down from there to Emmaus, which into the ordinary life. And they thought they had left all their hopes back in Jerusalem. We know where Jerusalem is today. You could go fly there and go into the temple and see these places where Jesus was spoke, where he was crucified and, 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 and uh, nailed to a cross. But what you cannot find in Israel is Emmaus. Nobody knows where this is. So Jerusalem, as it represents the place where you worship God, Jerusalem is the place that represents the presence of God, which all our hearts desire for. 
Jerusalem also became the place that represented their disappointments and their disillusionments. That's why I'm asking you, where are yours? All Christians experience these places where we're frustrated. We get disillusioned because of our unmet expectations. And that's what Emmaus represents, the place of nowhere. You're not going anywhere. You and I are, are, are just like, what is the meaning of life? You ever get to that place? And they're talking with each other, which is good. It's good to talk with one another and, and, and gripe and complain. <laughs> but it doesn't take you anywhere, any, just like there is no actually a Emmaus. You don't get anywhere in doing that. And they were trying to find some satisfying answers to all the things that they had hoped for. And they did not stay with the community of disciples that had remained in Jerusalem, the men and women. But they were seeking God in their discussion, just trying to make sense, the big why question. But were these two disciples alone? No. They were... Never alone, because in 15 it said, while they were talking and discussing these things, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So in those places where you feel like you're just headed toward an Emmaus and, 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 and you feel like you're starting to lose any hope, and, and, and it's like, you need to know. In those times, Jesus is with you. He is with you. He is with you. Jesus could have revealed himself to them in a way they could recognize him. He could have just said, bling, here I am. And they would have rejoiced and all three would have headed back. Do you ask questions when you read the scriptures? Why did Jesus hide himself? Why did he keep himself from being recognized? Some might say the reason they couldn't recognize him is they didn't have enough faith. But I think Jesus, God, sometimes hides himself, but for a purpose. The Lord hides himself to allow, and in this case, to allow these two disciples to wrestle with what really is troubling their hearts. Jesus delays his revelations for them to deepen their faith. Does your faith need deepening? God holds back his glory, which is his manifestation to us, the revelations of who he is. And those are the times we go deeper. If he had just, bling, here I am, everybody would have been happy, but but these two disciples would have not explored why there was a lack of hope in their hearts. Jesus, the point is, Jesus is with you in your darkest times, and you are never alone. It's that simple. Even when you don't experience him. Don't fall in the trap of racing after these places where you've heard Jesus is. And it's not, I don't mean it's not, it's not wrong to, go to concerts and conferences and all these kind of cool things to learn more and stuff. But you don't have to go to those places to find him because he's with you already. And sometimes the best thing you could do is just hunker down and say, Jesus, I know you're with me, so start talking because I can't see you. The second point of Jesus being with us. So first one was Jesus walks with you even when you do not recognize him. The second one is Jesus explores with you what makes your heart sad. So let's read verses 17 through 24. And so he speaks to them. He doesn't tell them. He does what? He asked questions. Did you ever think about how God asks you questions before he gives his answers? 
verse 17. And Jesus said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still. They stopped. Man, their hearts were so downcast, looking sad, it says. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, and I just like, what things? I'm clueless, Jesus says. Do tell me what happened to me. <laughs> and they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Where is your Emmaus? What makes you sad? Jesus was asking questions. He asked you and I questions to draw us out. And that word that in, uh, in verse 17, the last word, sad, can be translated from the Greek gloomy, downcast, dejected. So this isn't just, I'm, I'm a little sad today. This is deep, something within the soul where there's, there's this lowness in the spirit. And they found themselves in this state of sadness. And don't miss this part. When I say that Jesus explores with you what makes your heart sad, he cares. He's not just interested in what you're doing or in accomplishing. He cares what's in your heart and mind. Jesus was interested. Do you believe that Jesus is interested in you even when you're on a road to nowhere? Jesus was validating their feelings by intently listening to the answer they were giving to his own question, what things? And, and he was validating them even though they were in this place of lacking faith. So do not evaluate your worthiness of hearing Jesus ask you questions and then answer. That's the longing of his heart. He wants to commune with you, which we'll talk about. And they were sad because their expectations weren't met. Jesus was trying to draw these two disciples out of the gloomy places by being with them, asking questions and listening to their sad hearts. I do think, though, that the translators, the ESV translators, didn't quite translate that Greek word correctly. I think it's supposed to be all capitals. And I think, it, I think he was saying they, they had a, a, a sad disease. The acronym, right? You all know the acronym Seasonal Affective Disorder. Have you heard of that? That's what these disciples had. Do you know what the disease is? It's, well, affective just means something, affective means causes emotions and feelings, which they had a ton of. And I know we do too at times in our following Jesus. Disorder means lack of order, obviously. Confusion. There's depression associated, you know, with the seasons. It's a seasonal affective disorder. It's a time of season 
in our material world, our literal world, where we have less sunlight. It's the autumn and winter of our lives where, th- where we don't see the sun enough. And it causes this depression in us. And the symptoms include fatigue, depression, hopelessness, and, and, and social withdrawal. And I didn't even make that one up. That's just literally out of what the definition of seasonal uh, uh, affective disorder is. Do you find yourself in this place of, of fatigue, depression, hopelessness, social withdrawal? I know that's what this these two years have done to many of the followers of Christ. And what's the treatment for SAD? Light therapy, right. Phototherapy, and they can, and also you could then go on beyond that to talk ther- therapy and medication, but we're not going there this morning. So how can you say you don't get enough light? I mean. You have the lights on at home, right? Well, an ordinary light bulb cannot put the disorder of one's emotions into a healthy place. We need full spectrum light. We need the light like comes from the sun itself the sun and the sky. And so the, the treatment, and we now have these bulbs that give us the same kind of light that we have in that place. And then the Mayo Clinic, they would say, sit first thing in the morning, first hour of waking up, sit in front of that, that full spectrum light for 20 to 30 minutes every day. I think the same as spiritually. Wouldn't that be the way to help us spiritually with our sad disease? It's been 20, 30 minutes in in the face of the sun who gives us his full spectrum light. Amen. But the problem when I say that they that they have this social affective disorder is I didn't mean um, just emotionally material or uh, you know externally would be a better word. But they have what I would call is the savior effect of disorder. They, ha- they have sad. Their understanding of, their, of who Jesus is as the Redeemer is off. It's inadequate, like, like an incandescent light bulb that is inadequate in the light it gives you. And you think, well, I'm still living my life with just the ordinary lights on. But what they need, what you and I need, is a full-spectrum savior. Listen to their description of this again in our verses, starting with 17, as as Jesus asks them these questions, and their answer uh, to Jesus after verse 19, or starting with verse 19, they say concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Is that true? Was he from Nazareth? Yes. Yes. And his name was Jesus. Was he a prophet? Yeah. He was speaking prophetically the things of God. So everything they're saying is true. And not just that. But he was a prophet of God, a mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. He had done great miracles. He had done great feats. There, There was impossible things this prophet had done. There was no question he, he was from God. Is this true? It's, they're right on. Where's their sad? Uh, but then we get to the place where they say the chief priest and rulers delivered him up to condemn him to death and crucify him. Did that happen? There's a way in which you can know all these things about God and Jesus and still have a deficiency. And here we read it. Here's the the hinge. But, but, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Did Jesus, was, was Jesus the Messiah? Was he the Redeemer? 
but they had an insufficient encounter and understanding of Christ. So their hearts were sad. And even in light of the testimony of the women, and Sarah brought out so well last Sunday how in this Jewish culture the testimony of the women were not counted trustworthy. And Jesus was creating a new community with a new culture of equality, where even he, he made himself known, the risen Lord made himself known to the women first. That's why I wanted Sarah to preach that passage. And, 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 and so what was happening, and maybe not so much in our culture today as we're trying to passionately, as we should, seek, our, seek after equality for all people, they had something stand in their way. They had something outside of their box that they could not accept. But that is true for every one of us, you and me. There's things that Jesus will reveal about himself or say and go, I can't accept that. I, I, don't, I won't believe that about him when, he's, when he says this about himself or because everything I hear in the world says, no, he's not that. Or the things he asks of us and following him as a disciple, a man or woman, and says, well, I can't go there. He doesn't understand what it's like in the culture I live and that says all these things are okay and acceptable, and he challenges us. And so the question is, will we let Jesus define who he is for you and me? Right? They had hoped. They had hoped but their hope was anchored to a false expectation that Jesus, this Redeemer that they talk about in verse 21, redeem Israel from the oppression of a messed up government called Rome. Know of any messed up governments today? <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is, though, it, these outside things will never bring us hope. What you anchor your hope to, if it's outside of Jesus Christ himself, will never work. It only comes in a relationship with the Lord. Do you, do you realize in the Old Testament, Israel had the perfect government. It was created by God. He created the perfect constitution and way to follow, and yet... They didn't want the relationship, and it all crumbled in. So the answer's never outside of the Lord for where you find your hope. They did not need a Savior to deliver them from government, and we don't either. They did not need a new king to deliver them from Roman oppression. They needed a savior, though, that was more than just a prophet, a man, a godly man at that. A man anointed with the Spirit. They needed more than that kind of savior. They needed one who could redeem them from the darkness in their spirits and the oppression of Satan. And that's the kind of savior we need if we're to have hope. Amen. So what's the treatment? Well, it's losing our illusions of God, and that can be very difficult. I had to get laser treatment um, for my back, light treatment, light therapy. And, uh, and so Dr. Amy, um, I had to do many treatments, <laughs> many days coming back, and we started talking about light, and, uh, and, and, and she is. And we just kind of hit it off, this rapport, and so each treatment would take about 20 minutes, and she'd like, so I got this cool book written by this doctor on the brain. You want to read it? Because there's a chapter in there about light and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. So every time i come, she'd get the book. She'd go to her office and get me this cool book, which is on my Christmas list, by the way. But in it, I was blown away by a quote, because they're talking about the history of medicine and how even in our medis, medical community, there are boxes that are keeping us from, ha and this is written by doctors, there is, th and light therapy is one of those things that can do a lot more than just help a back, you know. But, uh, but I came across a story of Florence Nightingale, who was 
and it still is, one of the most influential nurses. And she was writing in 1860, and she has set the uh, kind of the, the standards of what it, for the medical community on, on how to care for patients. And she says this concerning the light. It is the unqualified result of all my experience with the sick that second only to their need of fresh air is their need of light. That after a close room, close meaning no air, what hurts the most is a dark room. And it is not only light, but direct sunlight that the patients want. People think that the effect is upon the spirits only. In other words, your emotions, right? This is by no means the case. And this is just the most beautiful line. And to me, it speaks of Jesus Christ. The sun, she's talking about the sun in the sky, but you could put Jesus in there, is not only a painter, but a sculptor. The sun is not only a painter, but a sculptor. Painting's two-dimensional, and it's only on the surface. And, and we can say we, you know, we need the light for its clarity and its warmth, and light gives life. That's on the surface. But even the medical community is discovering that light goes through the skin and affects our organs and our brain in ways that are quite profound, and I won't go into detail in that now. But Jesus wants to do more than just work of on the surface things of your life, the things that happen outside of your skin. But he's a sculptor wanting to shape your soul and your spirit into the image in which he's made you. Isn't that awesome? This is the true Savior, which leads me to the third point. Jesus communes with you so your heart will burn with true hope. There was also this quote in there, that book that said, another doctor said, and God's, and this wasn't written by Christians, people, and, it, and God said, let there be a paradox and there was light. I love that because it was, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. But our whole sermon series is about a paradox that we encounter God, and it forever changes us from not just the externals in which way you live our life by his truth, but internally. Jesus communes with you so that your heart will burn with a true hope not a hope that your life works out great and all your wishes come true and Santa's real. A true hope. When I say commune with you, that Jesus wants to commune with you, that word definition is to enter into a profound intimacy through communication of thoughts and feelings. Does communication always require Words? You ever just look someone in the eye, eyes, and there's a soul connection and things are communicated to you? You can see things, their sadness, their despair. You can see their love. When somebody asked me what's the first thing I remember about Jill when we were just were really meeting at a youth uh, a young adult Bible study at church. Y young people, by the way, that's where you want to meet that special person. And we were in this hayride, and the hayride with all these uh, young adults turned into a hay fight. And Jill's throws, putting hay down my shirt, and no, I'm not putting hay down her shirt. But I, I shouldn't have even gone there, but... But after the hayride, when I hopped down and people are getting off the wagon, there was no steps or anything, and I, and I helped Jill down. And the first thing I really remember about Jill is, was when I looked into her eyes and something happened to my soul. Uh-oh. 
<laughs> and that's what it's like to be with Christ. And, and when you look into his eyes, you see his love. You see there's something very special about him. And he sees things you can't see, and he wants to speak into those things. He wants to commune with you. Communion is a profound spiritual relationship with somebody that you share um, something in common. The, when you look at Jesus and you're spiritually, I don't mean physically see him, but when you look into him in the time of prayer, he sees in you his, his spirit. He sees that who he made you to be as a, as a woman, as a, as a man, and, he, and, and something happens in that communion. And that's what this whole story on the road to Emmaus is about, is communion. Jesus meeting these two disciples in their place of hopelessness, and he communes with them and brings them a burning heart. How many of you want a burning heart? Right, the hands go up. Of course we do. Who wants a sad heart? Nuh-uh. Right, brother. And Jesus tells them, was it not necessary that this Messiah would suffer. Christ means Messiah, the anointed one. In verse 25, he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Now the Bible students are going, wait. He already entered into his glory when he was filled with the Spirit and in his baptism? How about when he stood on the mountain and was transformed into his glory and Moses and, and Elijah met with him and Peter and John and James witnessed that he was full of light? That was partial glory. What kind of glory does the true Redeemer have? He came down from the, his mountain experience. He could have said, this is it. I'm in my glory. They've seen it. I've met with them. I'm returning to heaven now. His full glory, the manifestation of God in his life was to, was to be taken, blessed, broken, and given to you and me. His glory was to suffer, and the disciples struggle because that's not the kind of Jesus they wanted, one that suffers. And if you follow Jesus, how many of you are, are followers of Jesus Christ? How many of you want to be? It will mean suffering because your Lord suffered. But in your suffering, when you manifest all of who God is in your life, it, it glorifies God because it shows the world there's something different about you. A Christian should hear in their life from others, there's something different about you. What is it? that I don't get it, right? And I like that even though they did not recognize him, their hearts were already starting to burn just by being in his presence. And then he spoke over them the meanings of Scripture. And, and as he, they drew near, it says in verse 28, to uh, the village, to Emmaus, he pretended, he acted like, oh, see you guys. He was just going to keep going. Even though he was there specifically for them, and Jesus does that with us. It's like he wants, he's going to keep going. And do we say, no, no, no. Come into my home. Fellowship with us. Have a meal with us. And this meal they were having, by the way, is not communion. It was, it was, it was sharing a meal, which Jesus loves doing. The table, like the communion table, is the place of communion. It's a place of intimacy, sharing hearts, sharing thoughts. So what does it mean to when Jesus communes with you until your heart will burn with true hope? There's three, there's three things that happen in, in this last passage in verse 35 25 through 35, so let's read it. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Was not it necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, and when you hear Moses, it's not talking about just the historical Moses that helped deliver Israel from Egypt, but Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament that are called the Pentateuch. And so when he talks about Moses and all the prophets, he's talking about the whole of Old Testament, the law and the prophets. And he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And so they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, saying, no, 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 stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. The dark is coming. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, the eyes of their heart. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opens, so two things we see. First, there's he's just talking with us. He's being with us. And then while he opened the scriptures. So Jesus, the second thing is opening the scriptures. And they and they rose um, and they rose that same hour and he re- and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they, the the two disciples, told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So for that burning heart, first Jesus will reveal himself to the reading of Scripture because he's the fulfillment of all these things. The Scripture will bring light of truth to your heart and my heart if we will let him speak through us. So don't just read the Bible, but spiritually read it, inviting Jesus to give you understanding because it's about him. His Scripture will bring truth to your heart, and it will speak through you to your present life and questions and despairs that you might have. Jesus, by his Spirit, opens up the Scriptures that we might understand them. That was my experience when I was a young man, going to church and all that. I've tried to read the Bible, but I had not invited Jesus and his Spirit into my heart. I would read them, and these, things, these words were like kind of made a little sense, but it was just mostly frustrating until I stopped reading. It was when I invited Jesus into communion in my life that they began to take life himself. What does the light in the sky do? It not only illuminates, but it warms the body and it's necessary for life. Isaiah says in chapter 49, the second half of the verse, he says, God speaking through Isaiah, I will make you as a light. This is prophetic words of Jesus. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And then we hear Jesus in John 8, 12 saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What does the Son of God do? He also brings clarity, but to our minds. And he does... And he does bring warmth, which is a comfort to our heart. But his light gives us eternal life if we will believe in him. Romans 10.17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of God. you want a greater faith? Because Jesus said, Oh, foolish ones, how slow of heart to believe. With Jesus, read your Bibles. Second, Jesus draws us into a deeper into his presence through prayer. What is this story? This is a story of prayer. When you read the stories of Jesus talking to people, that's a conversation with God. How cool is that? So all these words that Jesus is speaking is coming out of a prayer these two disciples are having because they've invited him along in their journey to Emmaus. And in that place, It's more than learning truth about our Redeemer and how to think about Him. But it's how we need a spiritual encounter with Him, even in the reading of the Bible and in our prayers. 
And Jesus took that bread at the meal. And and we heard these verses before when he fed the 5,000. We heard these four words again at the Passover with his 12 disciples. And he took the bread and he blessed it. He prayed and prayed a blessing over it. And then he broke it and he gave it to his followers. And this is what Jesus did. God gave him to us. God blessed his son. And God allowed his son to be broken so that he could be given to you and me. And third, Jesus brings us out of isolation and back into his community. Did you catch that? After Jesus walked with them, after he opened up the scriptures, after in their prayer, he they recognized him. What did that? They now have a burning heart. What does a burning heart do? A burning heart leads you back in, out of idol, isolation, back into Jesus' community of faith called the church. So there's no one that can say they have a burning heart and passion of Jesus Christ in their hearts and yet remain alone. And when I say isolate, I'm not talking about in times like whether there's a virus that we have physically compromised systems and, uh, and we stay away. There's times when even without pandemics we get so ill we stay at home. But there should not be a continuing of isolation. And so we pray for a burning heart. Amen. I close with this uh, section before we do a special reading to enter into the presence of God ourselves. Romans 15:13. One of my favorite verses concerning hope. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all... What's Christmas about? Joy and peace. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Not believing for a better year, better job, better relationship. It's believing in Jesus Christ. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may be filled with hope. Jesus is with you. Are you with him? This kind of hope that he's talking about is a confident expectation in God's goodness, in your Lord's goodness. And so we pray that Jesus will give us a burning heart that fills up with passion for him. We pray for a burning heart that fills up with hope, anchored to his goodness and not our current circumstances. We want hearts that burn with God. So I want to invite Sarah and Aaron up here. And as they're coming up, let me just close with this illustration. Brennan Manning tells a story of a friend of his that illustrates the road to Emmaus so well. He says, several years ago when a minister friend of mine bottomed out. So if this could happen to a pastor or a minister, it can happen to you. It can happen to anyone's the point. When a minister friend of mine bottomed out and resigned his church and abandoned his family, he fled to a logging camp in New England. That was his Emmaus, what's yours? One wintry afternoon, he sat shivering in his aluminum trailer. The portable heater, electric heater, suddenly quit and died. That's a place of no hope. Cursing this latest evidence of a hostile universe, the minister shouted, God, I hate you, and then sank to his knees weeping. There in the bright darkness of faith, he heard Christ say, I know, it's okay. Jesus didn't rail at him, condemn him. He affirmed his sadness. And then the shattered man heard Jesus weeping within him, in his heart. The minister stood up and started home. He returned to Jesus' community. 
So when Jesus, Brennan says, wept within the brokenness of my minister friend, the ground of all being shook. The source of all life trembled. The heart of all who loved burst open in the unfathomable depth of God's immense, inexhaustible, inexhaustible caring revealed itself. So now we're going to do something to help you enter into the presence of Christ through the reading of scriptures first, just like Jesus did with these two from uh, Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. And you need to know there's 300 predictions in the Old Testament over that amount of Jesus Christ. So just close your eyes for a moment and hear these I want to just pray for all of us because Jesus is inviting us to commune with him this morning, not through the reading of these scriptures. And, and these scriptures are not just words about him, but he, you meet him in this place. And so I pray, Jesus, for every young and old man sitting here, every young and old woman sitting here, that we all have a fresh encounter, and our hearts will burn with you. Let us meet with you, Lord. May, I, I believe some of these prophecies, just a few of them that we're reading this morning, are some of the ones you shared with your disciples that were like lost sheep walking away from the fold and their shepherd. Meet us in these words. Let our hearts begin to warm and then burn with them, with you. Amen. The first prophecy of the Old Testament is Genesis 3.15, which is in the garden, and, and God says to Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking now to the serpent that led them away from God to disobey. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you, sh and you shall bruise his heel. Jesus crushed Satan when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. He is the fulfillment of the first prophecy from Genesis. Now let's look at the prophecies on the birth of Jesus. It's Christmas time after all. And, uh, and so maybe these are some of the ones he was speaking of his birth, starting with Genesis 22:18. God speaking to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So God is promising through Abraham that through his offspring, the line of David, that Jesus would come and, and Jesus has become a blessing to all nations this day. Micah 5.2 But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Jesus was born of a young girl, Mary, a, a, a virgin, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the Jesus that was born for you. And Jeremiah even adds on to that prophecy that, that there would be a great weeping. And we learn in the story of Jesus after he's born, King Herod rises up and destroys all the male children under two years old, and there was a great weeping in the land. Hosea 11.1 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And Joseph was warned, the father, the husband of Mary, um, and uh, just the human father of Jesus, though, they, though Mary was conceived of Jesus by the Spirit, God, with an angel, spoke in a dream, and they fled to Egypt. 
How could all these small details have happened? These were things out, out of the control of Jesus. He was an infant. He couldn't fulfill these prophecies. He did not have, he did not have those choices. But the Father in heaven revealed that even in Jesus' helplessness, he is the fulfillment of something amazing, the Messiah the, that God promised. Now the prophecies on Jesus um, is death and crucifixion. And in this, we see in these stories of Luke the fulfillment of these things, like from Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus did not arrive as a conquering king and with chariots and armies into Jerusalem. He came humbly on a donkey, and that's how God approaches you humbly. Zechariah 11.13. And the Lord said to Zechariah, Throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. And hundreds of years later, there would be a man, Judas, who would betray Jesus for 30 silver coins. And, he would, and in his guilt, he returned and threw it at the feet of the priest on the floor in the temple. All these small things being fulfilled to tell us that Jesus is a Savior and Redeemer. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And we see Jesus being brought before the high priest being falsely accused, speaking no words but remaining silent, brought before Pilate who says, why do you not defend yourself and speak for I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus remained silent like a lamb to the slaughter. Numbers 9-12. Uh, they must not leave any of it till morning or break any of its bones. When they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. And it was forbidden to break the bones of the Passover lamb that was sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins. And none of Jesus' bones would be broken by the cruel guards, the Roman uh, soldiers, though they would break the legs of the other two criminals crucified on each side of Jesus, but Jesus' legs, no, none of his bones were broken, though his side was pierced with a spear. Jesus, in Psalm 22, there are so many prophecies that Jesus would be forsaken. Jesus would be mocked. Jesus' mouth would even be dry, and that lots would be cast for his clothing. And all these things were fulfilled at the cross. Psalm twenty two sixteen. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. And Jesus' hands and feet were pierced by spikes at the hands of these Roman soldiers. And in Psalm 31 and Psalm 69, you could also see that it prophesies that Jesus himself would, would commit his spirit. He died because he chose to die. You could read that Jesus would be given vinegar for that thirst we heard about. How could these things, hundreds and hundreds of years, be spoken and all of them come true unless it's God himself making them fulfilled? Psalm 16, 10 through 11. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. For make known to me the path of life in your presence there is the fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore and Jesus three days later would rise from the tomb and this is our hope but not just his birth and death 
But let's look at the prophecies, because we tend to think in just what things happened outside. But look at the prophecies of Jesus, our Redeemer. The two disciples on the road to nowhere needed to commune with a Redeemer who could reach inside their hearts and give them new imaginations of who God is and, and a hope that would do away with their, their Savior, you know, affective disorder. And, and it happens as we come to know that Jesus is our pain bearer from Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 4. Understand that Jesus wants to carry your pain even before he carries your sin to the cross. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he shall be despised, and we esteem him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So what are the griefs and sorrows you are experiencing in your current circumstances? Ask yourself that. What are you experiencing? Jesus has experienced the same pain that you are experiencing now, though his circumstances were different. He is a priest that sympathizes with what you are going through, but he wants to exchange your sadness for his joy. Jesus is your pain bearer. When you come to the table this morning, if you believe in Jesus Christ, know that he'll exchange his joy for your sadness. But he's more than just a pain bearer. Jesus is also our sin bearer. And I like that Isaiah, God, when God spoke through Isaiah, first God is acknowledging that we have sorrows of the heart, but we also have sins. And sometimes the sorrows are due to the consequences of the choices that we have made. He goes on in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53 in verses 5 through 6 and 11, saying, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus bears your griefs and sorrows, but he also bears your iniquities, which is our sin. The, the, the things in us that twist the image of God, and we act out of that place. We need to take responsibility for also our sins, because these are the things that cause us to lose our joy and peace. Ask Jesus to bear your sins when you come to the Lord's table in exchange for his peace. But thirdly, Jesus is our redeemer of what was lost. There are things that have been taken from us in our lives, stolen from us by the world, destroyed by Satan, or things that we have given away. And Jesus redeems those in Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 3. The spirit of the sovereign God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor favor and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Jesus has paid the price. That's what redeem means. He paid with his life to redeem you because he loves you. He paid the price on the cross for your healing. He paid the price for your freedom, your true freedom of your soul. Even if you and I were thrown in prison today, if you have faith in Christ, you're still free in him. 
And he paid the price for your salvation that you may have eternal life forever. Thank you, guys. So I want to invite you now to have communion. I want to invite uh, the worship team up. And let's, let me pray. Let me pray for us. As I do feel, the Lord wants you to give you a burning heart. So close your eyes. Can you feel your heart? The Father loves you. Maybe you're walking away from him toward your, toward your Emmaus. What is your Emmaus? The place of sadness. What makes you sad? Invite Jesus to join you this morning. Invite Jesus to explore with you why you have this Savior affective disorder that has taken your joy away. Ask Jesus to reveal himself personally in your life as you meet him in the reading of scriptures and prayer. Ask Jesus to commune with you now that your heart may burn with passion and hope again. Invite Jesus to commune with you. Why don't we say this out loud together? Jesus, Jesus. I desire to commune with you this morning. I need you to be my pain bearer. I need you to be my sin bearer. I need you to redeem what was lost in my life. And may my spirit burn for you. May I confidently walk out the Father's will. Not at a duty, but at a passion. In your name, Jesus, amen.